Oh, I'm not pointing this thing in the right direction. Hey guys, I'm a little bit, uh, oh man, I gotta rearrange things. I forgot that my desk's position changed a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope the people can hear me. It looks like it is set up properly, but I'm always a little bit nervous that it won't be. Oh man, this camera's way off, isn't it? Hey Angel, how are you doing? All right. So, uh, this is my perfect. So this is a first for me doing uh, a stream like this to talk about a specific topic. Um, I will be talking about Unbound, the newest mask supplement. Uh, oh my gosh, this is such a good group of people in here. Uh, we, we have in the room right now uh, Angel from Equal Roll, which you should totally check out. Wonderful interviews uh, in both English and Spanish, as well as games in both English and Spanish. Uh, just fantastic work. Uh, Rob, do, who has is such an oh jeez, is such an active part of the RPG community that you already know him and are probably actively hanging out with him already. And of course, yeah, of course, Pippin is agreeing. Here's the toy that he's playing with today. It's like a, a Kong with like weird octopus legs. And Jeff Stormer, who's, uh, Rob, who's so connected to the RPG community that you're probably already hanging out with him. And uh, we've got Jeff Stormer in here as well, who has a Kickstarter going on right now. That is for Mission Accomplished. I'm gonna go ahead and type that. I need to figure out a way to put out links directly into uh, the feed in some way, other than just grabbing and sticking into chat, because I don't know if the chat actually persists and sticks around. Hey, how are you doing, Donald? Well, great to see you here. Let me make sure. Yeah, if you haven't backed Mission Impossible yet, I mean, Mission Impossible, Mission Accomplished yet, you absolutely should. Um, I, 94% funded, congratulations, man, you're so close, you're absolutely gonna make it. Uh, and I cannot wait to play this game again because I played it at Metatopia and it was amazing. Um, oh, Pippin is upset because the toy ended up in a box nearby. So now hopefully he'll give us a little bit of space and I'll pick him up in a minute so people can see him. But I want to... Pippin, you're killing me, buddy. Uh... Uh... Jeff? Oh, 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 yes. Oh my gosh. If it's, if it funds during this stream, we'll have to have some kind of little mission accomplished celebration. Uh, it would be great. Okay, come here. Come here. Come here. You're okay. All right. Uh, but the reason that this stream exists is usually that I kind of am coming on to check in and talk about my week in gaming, what things I'm excited about going through. But, uh, today I'm going to specifically... Uh, hop on to talking about a specific thing that I'm excited for, which is that Masks Unbound, the final, the final uh, expansion coming up for Masks from the Kickstarter, is going to be releasing soon. Um, it is a fantastic book, and I've had a chance to read it because I am a backer, and I just want to kind of talk about what's going on with that. There is going to be a mission accomplished uh, stream specific as well. So, uh, I'm, I'm hoping I, I wonder if I can even maybe get Jeff on it. Jeff, if you want to be on it. Oh yeah, actually I'm going to go ahead and plug this a little bit. Uh, the party of one feed, uh, the party of one is a podcast, which is two player RPGs starring Jeff Stormer and a whole bunch of amazing guests, uh, has an actual play of, uh, mission accomplished and it's very, very good. Okay. Come here. Come here. You need to calm down. All of you, you all need to calm down. Uh, if you've got more time on your hands, let me know, because I will... We should set that up. Uh, but, uh, let's hop back to Masks, A New Generation, Unbound. Uh, so I'm sure all of you already know Masks, because uh, maybe you listen to Protein City Comics, but it is a game of uh, teenage superheroes. It's really, really good. Uh, it is, uh, I've constantly referred to it as my favorite game, and it really is my favorite game. Uh, everyone should check it out. Um, 
if you... Bah, bah, bah. I do have a lot more time now, a lot... Oh no, like 40 hours a week more? Is that a good... Is, is that an... Was that an intentional job leaving? Oh, I'm nervous for Jeff now. Um, well, we're gonna have to talk. I'll check in, Jeff. Uh, here's Pippin, because he could not handle being down there. He has to hop up at some point and si say hi to everybody. Okay, well, Jeff, if you need anything, let me know. Uh, you are such an important part of the RPG community, and we should rally to make sure that we're taking care of you. You're one of ours in a way that's really, really important. Uh, yes! Masks Unbound! Let's jump back into that. Okay, are you okay now? Do you think you're gonna manage? Um, hi everybody coming into the chat! We're gonna finally jump into some <laughs> to be talking some content. So, uh, it is obviously, uh, produced and released by Magpie Games. It is a beautiful little game, and... Uh, the entire book is gorgeous, probably in part because it has such an incredible team on it. I'm gonna go quick just on like, I'm gonna just try to go through sort of section by section of the book. Um, the people involved with it are amazing. Uh, some of the people that are involved with it are on, in this chat often. Uh, Miguel, uh, who we all know as the author of Nahual is one of the two layout people, along with uh, Hal Mangold. Writing and design, Misha Bushyager, Brennan Conway, Fred Hicks, Mark Diaz Truman, Darren Watts, Rob Wyland. Like, those are names that you probably already know. They're, they're big names. Um, and just the entire crew is so good. Uh, the art is really cool in it. The art is by Alex Nierges. I hope I said that right, because I'm not 100% positive. Um, and, and Michael Lee Lunsford, who worked on the original Masks book. And just all of, just everything is so good in it. Uh, our direction, Marissa Kelly, who's fantastic. Just the whole Magpie team, everybody in it is so good. And, oh, I'm seeing uh, Angel at Equus Roll recently started running it for a big Spanish channel that mainly, that mainly plays D&D. You gotta give me that link, because I'm looking for some Spanish APs, because I want to work on my Spanish a little bit. So I can get to the point that I can play some games in Spanish with people. My Spanish is is very bad. So what is Masks Unbound? Um, it is a little bit different from the other expansions because each of the expansions was actually really different from each other. Okay, you're all right now. Uh, each of them came with a couple of playbooks, and this one is no exception. It has three playbooks. Uh, oh my God. But while Halcyon City Herald making yourself known, okay, go find a different toy. This is your loudest toy. Um, <coughs> not available, Pippin. Sorry. Uh, so the expansions have been so starting over. Masks came with a built-in setting of Halcyon City. And it has a lot of NPCs, a lot of characters, a lot of plot hooks, a lot of like custom moves specifically designed to help you to run the game in that setting. Uh, I'm in a kind of weird situation that when I run the game, I don't run it in Halcyon City because we wanted to do the podcast and wanted to be able to like sell t-shirts with proper nouns on them. <laughs> so... In order to avoid being in a situation of having like legal battles with Magpie, uh, not that I think that they would come after us because they're wonderful, but uh, we wanted to be sure that like everything was on the level, right? So that actually has put me in a really weird situation in terms of the game and the expansions because while uh, there is an enormous amount of mechanical stuff in all three of the expansions, uh, there's a ton of kind of the fluff, the things that would build the city, the, nar the narrative, the story, new characters, and things like that. So I'm going to talk about this expansion not only from the perspective of running the game in general, but what it also can mean for players who have done their own world building to do their own like city and setting. Um, Halcyon City Herald has a ton of articles that are really great inspiration 
uh, and a whole ton of custom moves. If you're trying to get into custom moves for masks, get that expansion because like every two or three pages, there's something amazing. Uh, then going on Agents of Aegis or uh, what's it? Is that the correct name? I think Agents of Aegis, something like that, um, is the second one. It has a ton of information on Aegis itself and provides uh, a couple new playbooks as well as having uh, the first kind of set of playsets that are in it. Playsets are a really cool technology because the indie RPG sphere has had this weird kind of hole in it that in traditional games and in OSR games is filled by modules. Things that really get you setting and saying like, here is a story to follow. You can go along this path and it will give you a great story and you're good. Um, there's some uh, there's some things like that for Dungeon World. Um, there's the Dungeon Starters and there's a couple of books specifically intended to do that same thing. But within things like Masks, it's there's not it's not there. Um, and as anyone who's followed my development of Pasión de las Pasiones knows, um, I think that really uh, play sets are something that are going to dramatically change the way that PBTA games are structured and give an opportunity to build up stories ahead of time so that players aren't in a situation of having to come up with everything if they don't want to. Um, none of the play sets, nothing in it tells you this is the only way to do it. It's just kind of creating the situation for the people that don't want to have to write every part. So that's what this book is, is play sets and playbooks. Uh, and that's very cool. Uh, the, there's some fiction at the beginning, tons of pretty pictures, but the core of the book is those two things. Play sets, which allow you to take the core game of masks and play it in a new way, and play books, which allow you to just kind of add a new level of weirdness. Because Unbound is by far the weirdest expansion to Masks. Like, the strangest playbook uh, that existed before this one is probably uh, The Innocent, which involves time travel by necessity. You have the young version of a hero that is now kind of dark and jaded. And this book, uh, two out of the three playbooks are like four or five factors weirder than The Innocent. And that's really cool and exciting because I think people have seen all of these really new takes on, not so much new, but kind of like bigger publicized takes on how you can do superheroes that really, while possible in masks, aren't really specifically supported yet. And so this allows you to do some of those things. Uh, some of it is really, really obvious what exactly it's setting up, and some of it is less so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them kind of to the best of my abilities. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to hit me with them. But the big thing that this is about is kind of going through my enthusiasm for these play sets because I'm really excited about them. Um, and I'll hit playbooks at the end because that might end up being more like, this is what I want to play in this, which is uh, less content-y, I guess. Um, the first playbook, the first play set is Iron Red Soldiers. Uh, it is essentially, <coughs> essentially you go from being a team of superheroes to like uh, young superheroes dealing with the older generations to being a team of young superheroes that are kind of the only big hope going on. Uh, it presents a world that has an alien takeover and it has the players essentially dealing with this dystopian future where they're trying, or dystopian present, uh, that they're trying to find a way to survive and build civilization and take back some power from a colonist group of aliens that have arrived. Um, the Tanji are really cool. They are these bird creatures um, that have birds because Masks is the is secretly a bird game simulator, as we found on Protean City. But uh, basically, 
having the Tanji arrive and take over. Uh, these beaks are are controlling what civil what uh, civilians are able to do as well as what supers are able to do. Um, they are uh, taking over the running of everything. And what the players do is essentially form a resistance group and provide a resistance group. In this setup, the heroes, the adult heroes, are essentially not available. You don't get to, like, go and talk to your mentor and have everything be super happy and cool and okay. You don't have a safety net when you screw up. Like, people get hurt, people get killed, things really get bad in a very real way. Uh, and so what is cool with this playset is that it really explains how to do every step of it. It introduces new allies and organizations that you can look at, uh, groups that can help you out. It introduces uh, ways to look at each of the playbooks that exist and tells you essentially how to run that and how to run each of those playbooks and how to play each of those playbooks within that setting. Uh, that might seem like kind of uh, like, like an obvious thing. Some of them are. Like when you're in the future, when you're in the dark future, uh, you are looking at like the delinquent and it's like, oh yeah, cool, that makes sense. Of course the delinquent is gonna be a rebel. But like saying, hey, uh, how do you play the doomed should the doomed have its connection to uh, to the Tanji? Like, should the nemesis and the doom be through the Tanji or should it be a different thing? And, like, it separates out all of the issues and kind of figures out the issues you're going to hit when you're trying to do this setting ahead of time. Uh, it does it for all the core playbooks. It does it for all of the new playbooks. It does it for all of the playbooks from the other expansions. So like if you have a brain in your group, you can go like, oh, this is the way to do it uh, and have it still work. Uh, so like uh, probably one of my favorite things about it is that it tells you which playbooks not to use. So as an example, uh, in Iron Red Soldiers, uh, it lists the star as one not to use because, quote, this playbook is all about celebrity in the public eye, which makes it totally unsuited for the secret covert war of Iron Red Soldiers. Leave it out. And that is kind of a, that's almost like a revolutionary idea of saying like, hey, we all know like you can set up your table and form your table and form your group by having certain playbooks in it or not. If you want a low power game, you don't want the Nova. Uh, but, like, having that as a codified thing that any GM can pick up and run it is so useful and so cool. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing, like, just, like, the enthusiasm for this, and, like, I'm so into it as well. This, this is essentially how to run Age of Apocalypse, right? Uh, and it isn't necessarily how to run Age of Apocalypse and also going back in time and, like, doing that whole uh, time thing, but it sets up what you need to have to have your dark future. And I think that's how I intend to use this because um, what we're always trying to do with Protean City is have like these continuity things and having things connected and everything like that. And so while we probably don't want to do a, maybe we do want to do a full campaign in a dark dystopian future, I don't know. Um, it's really, it's very tempting. And this is what's really cool about this book is that it's super, super tempting to do all of the different things. It describes how to make clocks for each of the allies and how to run those clocks, when they should be affected, what should be happening at each step of those clocks. It gives you information on how to make your own mission because missions are gonna be different in this because it isn't like, go stop the girdled lizard. It is something bigger. You're tackling larger things. And it's really set up in a way that I think would make it very easy to do so. Uh, like, you set your objective, you come up with a list of things you need for that objective, and the way that it's all worded out and explained here is so valuable. Uh, it has 
rules for if you don't do all your objectives. It's it's just it's a brilliant, cool little thing. Uh, then also into kind of the realm of things that are less specifically useful for people that are doing their own setting, but is still like, you know, good to be able to look at, is it has some NPCs and looking at like how those different NPCs are put together can be helpful to go like, oh, it's all right for me to use characters in this way. And like one of the things that I think is most useful at looking at NPCs, and there are a ton of them in this book, is looking at the moves. Uh, the moves for uh, one of the, the Tanji NPCs that is introduced into this are so cool. Like, uh, one of its moves is uh, Punish, Resistance, and Rebellion tenfold. And that's such a good move because you can use it in like your little moment where someone is like standing face to face with you, but you can also use it like as a move after a big mission. And just like all of that there is so handy. Hey Anime Knight, nice having you in here. Uh, and then there is the coolest thing in each of these playbooks. I know I'm kind of like saying, yeah, there's the cool thing, there's the cool thing. But this is the number one thing that every GM of Masks who wants to play in a different universe or a different setting should be buying this book for. Agendas, principles, and moves. Every single playset has a new set of agendas, principles, and moves that layers on top of the core agenda pl principles and moves. Like, I have said a lot of times that agenda principles and moves for the GM are one of the most important, are the most important thing for the GM to have at the table, and possibly the most important thing about what PBTA is, because it is the format of that that gives the conversation going back and forth. Um, I don't want to give too much away, because I don't want, I know it hasn't even technically been like released yet, but uh, like, Iron Reg Soldiers has its own agenda. It has four new principles. It has four new moves. And there's specific moves to that setting. That said, there's specific moves to that setting that you could very easily transplant into your own game in a way that really makes sense. If you're doing the, um, if you are playing X-Men and you're playing Age of Apocalypse, uh, offer them costly help is really good. Uh, Echo Past Choices is really good. And like just having those at your table and going, right, this is a darker game. This is the way that we're going to tackle. Making sure that we have that feeling is just so choice. Um, I would love to bring Iron Red Soldiers to uh, Protean City at some point. Uh, I think if we ever introduce a player character that's an Arbinger, I'm going to require the player to play a session in Iron Red Soldiers ahead of time. <clears throat> Obviously that isn't going to be right for every group, but uh, for how we run things, having like a little glimpse into this dystopian future ahead of time I think would be really, really fun. And uh, even if you're taking out the Tanji, even if you're replacing the Tanji with something else, then it still is so... it, it has everything you need to make that happen. Uh, Anime Night, uh, Iron Red Soldiers is the first playset in Masks Unbound which is uh, coming out very soon. I think it isn't quite out yet. Um, backers to the Patreon, I mean, backers to the Kickstarter have it now. Um, but it's essentially a dystopian future where you're playing as uh, young rebels that are trying to uh, reclaim Earth because Earth has been conquered by, uh, like, these colonial aliens. It's, it's very good. Uh, but... Let's say you didn't like Age of Apocalypse. You don't like the whole, you know, dark future. I get it, but you still want things to be nice and dark. Spiderweb. Uh, the Spiderweb is the second playset, and it is essentially... <laughs> I would say it's essentially Defenders, but it's so much weirder than that. And that's one of the things that's really cool with Unbound. Oh, h hey, who's this person I see in the chat right now? Uh, Brendan G. Conway, uh, I'm, I'm assuming on the first name, it might be a different first name. Hi, Brendan! Nice to see you in here! 
What if you want to play with 20-sided dice? How could you do that? Well, uh, if you look at your percentile numbers, you can roll a d6, you can roll 2d6 using a d20. Uh, let me see if I can find using d20. Stop talking, I'll have, to, I'll have to start being nice now instead of just shouting his praises at the top of my lungs. Uh, let me see, 1 to 8 is a fail, 9 to 17 is a soft success, 18 to 20 is a full success. So yeah, Brendan Conway, uh, straight up handling that question. Um, just to say where we are, because I see there's a couple more viewers in here, uh, we're going through Masks Unbound, which is Brendan Conway's new expansion to Mask by Brendan Conway. Uh, Iron Red Soldiers was the first one we went through. It's a dark dystopian future kind of setting. It's very, very cool. Uh, yeah, you don't have to hide now. <laughs> Be in here. Let me correct me if I'm wrong on stuff. I've only read through the book once, and I read through it in kind of like a fever fit of having to consume all of it. Um, it actually came out the night that we intended to record the finale for the big Falcon Down event that people have been watching on Protean City. And so, uh, so it was kind of like a thing that it was like, okay, uh, a gas leak happened and we had to leave the recording early. Uh, and then I drove a whole bunch of hours and then I read it over the weekend in like two days. Um, but it's what I'm going to be coming back to, to get like all of the info from. <coughs> so you like the defenders. You're all broken up about the fact that Iron Fist has been canceled. I'm very sorry. It's 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 a hard space that we're living in right now, uh, and the spider web is kind of there to help you sort of deal with that. Uh, it has this really cool setup about it though, because it doesn't just say, "Hey, what if you're a hero that people? What if you're a hero that the main heroes don't care about?" Because that's kind of what's going on with the Defenders, right? The Defenders are saying, hey, we're going to take care of the people that other people are ignoring, right? Uh, and that is a super cool story. But there is always the problem of, if we have Superman, why do we need anybody else? And I think the spider, uh, the spider web really handles that very well. It has this cool meta plot going on where we've splintered into a new alternate dimension that doesn't have all of the great Halcyon City heroes. Uh, and like this character, the spider, rises up through the criminal ranks and kind of takes over everything. And that is what it's really about. It gets that like kind of kingpin feel. It has a lot of like, it, it, it has like, I guess kind of like some sp some Spidey, some Punisher, some Daredevil that are like on kind of the, when things are on kind of the lower level of stuff that, uh, that people are, that most of the villains that you're fighting are non-powered, that you are like in way over your head, that the big concern isn't Galactus, it's a gang war that takes out half of, uh, half of, uh, Hell's Kitchen, right? Um, I'm super, yeah, I'm super into the spider web as a setting. And what's cool about it is that the entire setting isn't just Halcyon City without supers. It's Halcyon City changed so that it never had supers, but now it's starting to. So, like, the whole history of Halcyon City is gone, but some of the same characters still show up. So you have, like... Like, as I was talking about, like, the playbooks you don't want to play are in some ways one of the coolest things about this. And so, like, it says, like, hey, no legacy. Because there isn't a legacy. There's no long lines of superheroes. You putting on the mask, you being, essentially being kick-ass, um, is the first set of people hopping on and, like, doing this thing. Uh, Angel, you've got the exact right idea, at least on my read, that this is, this is masks on Netflix. Um, that you have this grittier world and like the game has things, this playset has things to help you back it up. 
it has things that keep you gritty, that keep you low powered, and like it has it has just the addition of of physical threat, right? Like uh, the there's a rewritten take a powerful blow move that is that is like a little tiny switch that honestly is 99% of what you need to turn your mask game into a truly gritty, truly hard-hitting, uh, like, you know, noir superhero thing. Because I also looked at this, and I thought, oh my god, Spider-Man noir. Um, and I'm super pumped about that. <laughs> I want to play Spider-Man Web 2. Uh, Spider-Web looks so good. Um... There was actually a brief time, don't tell Brendan, and Brendan, don't listen to this if you're still in the room, that I was considering writing a uh, dark adult heroes uh, fighting for your neighborhood game, and occasionally I do still sometimes think about that, and if I ever do, I'll be looking at a lot of things in this. It does some really important things, like it... It has the same, it has the same thing of like helping you to set up your sessions in a new way, because your neighborhood matters. Like if you've watched Daredevil, you know, like my wife and I, when we watched Daredevil, would constantly turn to each other and say things like, just at any point, wow, it's Hell's Kitchen is really an important part of this story, and or the connection that we have is really about Hell's Kitchen more than anything else. Um, it's okay, baby pup. Come here. You need up? No, you just want my attention. Um, and so it has you make a neighborhood, which is like, okay, of course. And you shouldn't be going out of your neighborhood. Like, your game is in your neighborhood. If you are playing Spiderweb and you oh. fly across the country or go to a different, or go to a different country or go to a different world, like, you've done it wrong. This should be about the community, and this this makes it about the community in a way that's really, really cool. Um, it has a faction system, it has a bunch of NPCs in it, it has ways to make important NPCs. Like, Pops essentially exists. This game has you make Pops, and has you make Pops Barber Shop. Um, and it, I think it, it has like a kind of a... I think it has something that might be might be Pops. Um, I see Miss Hope Baker's hair salon, which I saw that and, like, managed not to shout out that's Pops while I was hanging out near the fire. But it's, it's, it's Pops. And that's the best. Uh, no, it's, I wasn't talking about Funko Pops. Wow, suddenly, I think my excitement about Spiderweb has come through a little bit. Uh, Jeff, yeah, making neighborhoods is so cool. And the way that they're put together is really good. It's a good neighborhood mechanic. Uh, Rob, if you like neighborhood mechanics, you should check it out. It's light, um, and it isn't hugely numerical, but it doesn't need to be. It's really cool. Uh, it has some, some more rules for gangs, because that is something that isn't so much in the core rules. Like, there's rules for it, but there's nothing, like, super deep, because most of the time, if you're fighting a gang in regular masks, you just crush them. You just win. But I think you should, if you have a group that is a low power group, grab these rules and pull them out. Even if they have a higher power group, like, if you think of minions more in, like, the Doombot way, that they are a legitimate threat, like, that's really cool. <coughs> Fleshing out gangs, I think, is a really cool part of this that, that I might bring to my regular masked game all the time. And to be honest, with the the change to uh, take a powerful blow is something that has inspired me for something for the uh, Protean City finale. So, not finale, the Protean City uh, Falcon Down finale. Um, oh, what, what? Yeah, there, uh, this game, like, this book has already had me changing things in my own game and how I do. Uh, yeah, there's a change to Powerful Blow for Spiderweb. And the way that it was set up 
made me take a look. Oh, so so Spiderweb is this very dark, gritty Netflix style uh, street level heroes taking care of your neighborhood storyline. It's really really cool, um, and it has a change to how you do take a powerful blow, and I think that that is just from a mechanical standpoint, maybe one of the big ways that we should be looking at making like modules or play sets for PBTA games and for uh, other indie games. Having like a little rule change can make a huge difference that changes how the whole thing works. Uh, again, as mentioned before, agendas, principles, and moves. That is what makes every PBTA game work so well. Um, and this one specifically challenges, it says it has the principle of challenge issues of race and gender. And that's super, super cool. Yo, $60 to funded for mission accomplished. Everyone should go back it if you haven't. Uh, but that is, but just back to Spiderweb. Uh, like you have the move dirty the hands of all involved. And it has you looking at, like, any moment, any time there's a 6 minus, any time there's a 7 to 9, you can be doing that. And you should be doing that. Because that is where that kind of comic lives, right? That's where you start looking at those things. Uh, everyone should check out Spiderweb. Spiderweb is so good. All of them are so good. I want to play all of them. This is really the problem that I'm facing right now is that if I could, I would be running all of these playsets. <clears throat> On to the next one. The next one is Phoenix Academy. It is uh, probably the one that I've heard people talking about the most ahead of time. Uh, not necessarily knowing that it was going to be Phoenix Academy, but talking about uh, the, the game that they are running or want to run or have an intention to run, or feel like there should be some more rules for, and it is what it sounds like. It is X-Men! It is your super-powered school. It is your way to play Harry Potter. It is your way to play X-Men. It's your way to play New Mutants. It's your way to play all of the stories that take place in the school. It has the very cool Phoenix Academy with an enormous amount of fiction behind it. Uh, I can't speak to your to My Hero Academia because I've never actually watched it, which is something that James makes me uh, make try is trying to make me do. Uh, our Hero Academia, your no, it's it's not Our Hero Academia because I haven't watched it yet. I think it's Your Hero Academia. Um, but yeah, that's what Jeff said. No, but he said it to me. Who'd you say it to? The Chats Hero Academia. Um, but it's that. It is, presumably, if My Hero Academia is anything like it sounds, then uh, that's probably the same thing, because it's, it's a superhero school, and it has, it has a whole history of the school, which is a super cool history. It feels like uh, the X-Mansion in that it is a history that is fraught and has, like, a whole lot of different big problems. Um, I... It, I don't remember, I think it was burned down. Yes, it was burned down, it was destroyed. That's important. Um, it's got a, a headmaster that is, uh, that is a little dark and scary and cool. Uh, and that is what, uh, what you want in like your dramatic, your, your kind of your superhero teenage soap opera, right? Pippin accidentally got his toy underneath my chair. So I'm gonna get that out from under there real quick. This will just be a second. Are you okay? Yeah, you're okay. He's just going a little crazy. He wants my attention. He hears me talking in an excited voice. <coughs> I think, honestly, this is probably the setting that has been most, that has been most attempted without the playset, right? Like, because there's the core game that doesn't involve your superhero school, but I know tons and tons of people have been doing superhero schools. Like, uh, Picoy, uh, in Protean City is essentially a superhero school, and I'm definitely going to be looking at this whole section and going a little bit deeper, seeing what I can grab out. Uh, it has 
advice on how to set up like the clubs and cliques and ways to work it out and how to do those different things. It has information on faculty and staff, both in terms of some that pre-exist and how to help you make more about it. Uh, the nice thing about this playbook is that like, hey, everyone can play on this one. Um, really, any of the playbooks work, which is a nice thing. Uh, although I do think it's good to be able to like cut some out. And I think there's one or two that are like, there's, there's a couple that are a little bit more like, Hey, get that figure, get some things figured out ahead of time. But like having that question of why, uh, of why you would do it makes a big difference. Like there's the harbinger, which I'm going to talk about later. You're from a dark dystopian future. You're here to try to change things. Um, and that kind of doesn't make sense as to why you would be there until the book like gives you that. And it says like, hey, you, uh, you have to do that because it has to do with your quest regarding the future. Cool, now that makes sense. Now you can do this. And so just having that there is useful. It has a set of faculty questions that, ask, that you ask at the beginning. Um, it's a little bit like Monster Hearts room creation but it's more about like the relationships of the characters to the faculty. Um, I think honestly, if I were running this, I don't know that I would include the built-in NPCs just because we've got the Protean City thing that we're doing things very, very separate. But by having the faculty questions, you have enough to build out the NPCs from. I think honestly, you could build the NPCs off of these questions. Um, that said, if you're using the NPCs, you've got to find, you got to make little like stand up little cards for them with their names and a little bit of information. Um, they've got like some pictures of some of the characters. They've got pictures of a couple of the, of the teachers, not like out, like here is Professor Positron, but like, you, you know, you, you grab the characters that exist and put them out and you have people talk about it. And like, I think honestly, it, it really seems perfect to do your superhero school. Um, it has a rumor skill, I mean, a, a rumor move, which is really cool. It's, uh, it's really great. I don't want to talk about it too specifically because I don't want to give away too much of like the mechanical side of things. But it has, uh, <coughs> it has the most important thing that an academic game could possibly have. And that is a move that helps you to do the whole school thing. It's really easy when playing a game set in a school to set it in a school and have school never ever come up. And so that is, so there is like an academic move and it isn't an academic move that makes it so that you have to constantly deal with it either because I don't think most people want to play a uh, superhero math class where we all sit around and do math while being able to shoot ice in theory. But what this lets you do is it lets you have academic things be a serious thing. It lets you have teachers connect with you and try to push you and m make you molded into what you ought to, ought to be. Like this is a label shifting palooza. Uh, and this move really creates like a core of the setting. Um, if, even if you're not putting it into the Phoenix Academy, which is a well-realized, very nicely put together setting, having this move will make your game feel more academic. Oh, what's that you got? Okay. Um, additionally, like you could use this move even without having the game set fully in a school. Most Masks games, you're going to have a lot of characters that do go to some form of schooling. And I think that this move could honestly be picked up and stuck in somewhere else with probably a little bit of a change for one of the results um, on the 7 to 9. Um, but it's it's good. It's really nice. Uh, and then, of course, it has instructions on like how to build things up and how to make your sessions run well, how to how to do things as the team, your first session. Uh, it has some stuff about dating, which is super important. Uh, 
and then agendas, principles, and moves. Uh, all of them are backed up by that, which is the probably the most important thing to have in a module style thing. <clears throat> oh my gosh, I think I'm because I'm getting excited talking about these different things. Uh, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. Uh, but the moves are really good. The principles are really good. It will this will turn your game into a school game. Uh, and just taking a look, <laughs> yeah, I, I played, I played superhero, superhero academics without any of the, uh, superhero side of it, but it's this game, this will turn your superhero game into a superhero school. It's very good. But we have to pause for a second because Mission Accomplished has just funded! Congratulations, Jeff Stormer! That's absolutely amazing. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of you. That is incredible. I cannot wait to see this game. We did it! Mission... Ugh. Mission Accomplished. Little Pippin for celebration. Yay! Woo! Jeff, uh, I task you with the important job of doing something celebratory. Uh, you have worked so hard to make this happen. You are a fantastic game designer. I'm very proud of you, a dear friend. I cannot wait to see you soon. Uh, that is so cool to, have, to be here and be kind of like chatting with you guys a little bit. Mission accomplished is gonna be amazing. I cannot wait for everyone to get a chance to play it. Pippin, say hi to Jeff. Wish him happy tidings, or just sniff my microphone. Okay, you're all right, you're done? I think Pippin's done with this. Ugh. If, blur. I will say on the uh, mission accomplished front, there are still a bunch of stretch goals and I'm interested in those stretch goals. Uh, the reason that I am able to do this Masks Unbound stream right now is because of people hitting stretch goals, which is about people jumping out, people telling people, be on your feed, be on your Twitter. That's how these Kickstarters get really, really big. Uh, but I know that people are here for masks, and so I'm going to bring us back to it. <clears throat> oh, especially because it's 648, jeez. This has been tough to get through. It's so much stuff, and there's so much I still want to talk about. Uh, masks Unbound. So, uh... But this does actually, because this is funded, this does confirm that there will be a chatting about Mission Accomplished uh, stream coming out. Because uh, now that we know it's going to exist, I am so excited to talk about it. So, did y'all like Thor Ragnarok? I liked Thor Ragnarok quite a bit. And I think that this next playset, the Apocalypse Sonata, is how you make that happen. Um, I have talked a lot about space comics. I love space comics. Star Jammers is like one of the best comic books, not because it's good, but because it's the best space comic. Uh, and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, super amazing. And this lets you do those things. This lets you step outside of the standard, uh, kind of the standard Earth setting, and in a way that really makes sense. The way it's described is teen superheroes on a road trip through space and time, and that is exactly the feel that this playset is going to make. Um, <coughs> hi James! We're talking about uh, the fourth playset in uh, Masks Unbound, the Apocalypse Sonata. Also, in case you didn't hear James, uh, Mission Accomplished just funded. Wow, it's super exciting. Um, there is not a Super Pets playset. Uh, that is something that should exist. Um, I'm intending to run a Super Pets game at some point as Protean City Comics, but uh, having stuff in there, uh, it's not quite put together yet. But yeah, this is uh, Apocalypse Sonata. It has a kind of like a version of the Infinity Gauntlet that is way, way cooler within the Apocalypse Sonata itself, the 
It's the music, the music of the spheres. And it just has all of this super, super intriguing information. Like, I went into this book saying I can't take any of the fiction because our fiction is separate from the fiction so that we can make, uh, so that we can do our own separate thing. But this is so cool and I just want to steal it and just use it directly. But yeah, teen superheroes on a road trip through space and time. And that's really what it aims towards and does. It has it, it has the, it gives you some, some big, dark, cool enemies to deal with. It gives you information on how to like run the hosts of Ominous, which, come on, everybody needs a big, cosmic, absurd, huge hero. James, Light Show in Space is a great idea. Uh, the Star is one of the playbooks that is set up as a great idea to use. Um, but uh, it this, as with all the other playsets, it helps you to get to that point. I think this one maybe does the best job of moving you from a regular game of masks to this game of masks. I think uh, Red Iron Soldiers is more of a standalone game. I think the spider web you could theoretically do as a crossing over to another dimension and is maybe the coolest way to do it because that's... I love dimensional stuff. Uh, but this really has you starting out with uh, being in Halcyon City and experiencing the Apocalypse Sonata on Earth and then where that takes you afterwards. Uh, as with the other ones, it has a whole big description of how to include all of the core books and little information on how to pl and little shorter snippets on how to play the limited edition books. Uh, it's all really good advice. <coughs> oh my gosh, I'm talking too much, talking too loud. Uh, but one of the things that is very cool is that it has essentially pre-set up lots of information on how to make stuff work. Like, if this is when our team first came together. Because, like, that's a big factor. You can... you It has information and help on how to do that. Okay, Rob, have a good, uh, have a good dinner. Uh, check out this game, Get Masks Unbound. Uh, if you haven't backed Mission Accomplished, go do it. I think you have. Um, oh, hey, here's a mad cool thing about Apocalypse Sonata. It has rules for creating worlds. And it has, like, an explanation of how to make that happen. Because one of the things that is most important in this game is getting, uh, getting characters to a point, uh, that they're exploring different worlds, right? Like, it's only exciting to travel to different worlds if the worlds are actually different. It also has some sample locations that are really Kirby-inspired. This entire thing is so Jack Kirby from the top to the bottom. And, like, I think maybe even the the uh, agenda is, like, make things uh, Kirby-esque. But, like, the first sample location is the planet of intelligent dinosaurs. And it is so good. It is amazing. It has... Ugh. I don't want to just talk about dinosaurs. There's so many. How many planets are single living organisms? I don't know if any of them in here are... Uh, there is a pulsar orbited by space wheels, though. Ugh, it's so good. Um, yeah, create a Kirby-esque sense of wonder is your agenda. Kirby, Jack Kirby created just wild, incredible worlds that are huge, that are bizarre, that are so far out of experience. Um, and it's 100% worthwhile to check out and read a bunch of Jack Kirby if you can. Um, that's just some, some of the best space comic stuff. <coughs> there came a time when the old gods died. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but the principles in it are maybe... <laughs> we are talking about Jack the King Kirby right now. Um, uh, oh, it's... I, I should find, like, a list to to bring and show people. Uh, James, is that an existing one?
I don't know if that's an existing one or not. But that would be a great world. And you could actually build that pretty easily in this. Um, the things that is maybe the best thing for the Apocalypse Sonata is... I think the world building is wonderful. Um, the principles really capture that Kirby feel. Like, even if you don't know Kirby well, having things set up in that way really works. Um, there's a little section on the road trip as agenda, and that's absolutely what I think you should be going for, right? Like, the the game isn't about, like, just solving one thing. It's about the journey, and I'm into it. And that gets us through the playsets. Man, uh, does it, if anybody has any questions about the playsets, feel free to shout them out. Um, I think any of them could honestly be used to play a full game of Masks. I would happily play any of these playsets start to finish on a character. Start to finish on a couple character. <clears throat> In terms of like, uh, here, wait, what page number is that? 123, okay. Uh, for each of them, how snarky about Masks are you allowed to be in this chat, uh, James? Uh, as as snarky as you'd like to be, but I might fight you on it. Um, oh, Alice, Red Iron Soldiers is apocalyptic, is like an apocalyptic future where like aliens have taken over. Um, I would connect it to kind of like an age of apocalypse, that there are people running things, that things get really dangerous. Uh, Angel asks, I have a question. How can I get the time to play with all of these playsets? Because that's what I want right now. Uh, yeah, that is, if I figure that out, I will absolutely get in touch with you. I think it has to do with time travel. <coughs> James, you can get the hell out of this chat. No, all of the villa sets keep having basic moves. Uh, and it doesn't cut down to four basic moves like you think PBTA ought to be. Um, but so like, what's really cool reading these different play sets is seeing what I would want to do as a GM and also what I would want to do as a player. Like reading Iron Red Soldiers, I was just seeing like, oh, this would be so much fun to play as a transformed and having like, oh, I can't hide. I am scary and I'm in a world that is full of people that are scary and like having all those different things, having those aspects of it is really cool. Um, also like it has rules for like using the legacy and using flashbacks for it, which is super, super cool. Um, in Spiderweb, I, needless to say, was just like, the Janus, the Janus, I just want to be the Janus. Because when I look at Spiderweb, I'm wanting to spend all of that time uh, having the danger floating above me. Because the Spiderweb makes it so that every mistake you make comes back at you hard. And that's so cool. Um, in Phoenix Academy, Phoenix Academy is that super, is like super weird and cool. And I feel like the newborn would be a really cool way to go with that because there's so many opportunities for people to tell you how you should be living there. Um, oh, I bet the bull, the bull would be really cool in Spiderweb. Absolutely. Um, that kind of gets to like, I guess kind of that Luke Cage sort of space. Um, uh, and the Apocalypse Sonata, just everything is open. Like I would want to play something wild. I Or I'd want to play... Uh, the Captain, which is a playbook that is uh, by Brandon Leon Gambetta. It hasn't come out yet, uh, but you'll be seeing that as soon as I write it. <laughs> I actually don't know that I would want to play the Captain. I would want someone else to play the Captain. I have some ideas. I want to to do more space stuff, more weird space stuff. There should be always more space stuff. Uh, James says I want to run a masks in space game for you, Brandon. I would absolutely play a masks in space game. Uh, we can put that on the feed at some point. We can start scheduling it in. I'm sure, I doubt people would mind if we had things going around. The Captain Star-Lord. Yeah, the Captain is definitely Star-Lord. Um, the Captain is also Corsair, uh, which is the one that I, like, need to have, because all piratical. Jeff says, a legacy except all of your legacy versions are all of you due to a ridiculous amount of time travel and all alternate universe shenanigans. I actually had a brief time that I was looking at, <laughs> at reflavoring my character eventually through an alternate dimension shift. 
I've got some stupid ideas that I want to do. I want to do something like that. I would love that. Have uh, Wind Shear and El Nino. I don't know. Uh, where do I sign up for this Mask Space game? Uh, I I don't know. James, you gonna run that sometime? I would super do that. Uh, I love space. Uh, James is great at space stuff. Uh, but we should do that. We should not talk about this right now. This is bigger than that. Let's talk playbooks. Um, the, probably the thing that people most look for in PBTA games is new playbooks. Tons and tons of people, yes, enter the Windverse. Have I talked to you about my Enter the Spider-Verse plans I have? I have some Spider-Verse plans. Separate and completely disconnected from Spider-Web. Um, uh, that I'll, I'll probably be doing a stream at some point, or a, maybe a uh, stop, hack, and roll about it. We should talk. Um, but one of the main reason people buy expansions to BPDA, PBTA games uh, is to get new playbooks. Uh, adding a new playbook at your table can really change the way a game feels and introduce all sorts of new possibilities for stories. And this adds three super weird ones. I'm not going to talk about them too much in depth right now because uh, I want to come back and talk about them again in more detail. I kind of think that it's worthwhile at some point to do individual streams chatting with somebody about how each of the playbooks work. Um, I want to do more directed mass content and I think that that's maybe a place that I want to go into, so I don't want to dive in too deep on it yet. But the three playbooks are The Harbinger, The Nomad, and The Scion. Uh, people may have seen those previously if they uh, are backers. Uh, the Harbinger is by Fred Hicks. The Nomad and the Scion are by Brendan Conway. Uh, Brendan Conway wrote some game... Uh, new Generation of face coverings or something. Um, and the problem that I have with these playbooks is that I super want to play all of them, and they're too conceptually set similar to the exact kind of character that I build and make all the time. Um, this book kind of feels like a targeted attack because I love space travel and I love darkness and I love uh, like people who think that you're a villain but you're not a villain. Um, you may notice that I've essentially described my Protean City Comics character with time travel and uh, changing dimensions and everyone thinking I'm a bad guy. Um, James, I have, uh, have I ever been to, have I even been to space? I believe I existed in space as Earth is a part of space, so deuces. Uh, yes, Brendan Conway wrote Marvel vs. Capcom A New Generation. Um, great game, my very favorite of them. Um, or Spaces in All of Us. But let's talk a little bit about each of these playbooks. Um, I don't want to go too deep into them. I'm not going to go on to like an individual move level because I want those to be in front of people before I talk to them at that extent. But I'm going to talk a concept, what I really like about them, uh, why I'm sad that I can't just play them, uh, and what I would want to see in terms of introducing them to the Protean City world. Uh, because I know we have a bunch of people in here that are familiar with Protean City. Uh, so the Harbinger. Uh, the Harbinger, you're from the future, and you know how things turn out. Uh, it is a playbook that you were in the future, you saw this probably dark, horrible world, and you want to come back and change things. You know that things go bad, and that things uh, that happen now make a difference in the future. And so you're coming back to be, uh, dare I say, a mutant messiah? Um, this is, this one is X-Men as hell. Uh, it is, it allows you to play, like, you can totally play, like, Cable, uh, Bishop, uh, Rachel Summers, uh, you can play the straight-up Age of Apocalypse or, uh, Days of Future Past style things, and you are just going back and trying to fix things. Uh, I don't know Trunks, unfortunately. I don't know... I don't know that that makes 
makes sense for Tamlin, James. Uh, oh, oh yes, I forgot. You have a a fanfic that you plan to write where where this is the Harbinger. But all that aside, the game really changes in a really really big way when you introduce any of these three playbooks. Like these three playbooks each have a mini game encoded within them. Uh, and that is something that isn't in any of the other playbooks. Like, you kind of end up playing, I don't want to say like a three-dimensional chess, but you end up playing a new layer of fiction on top of the standard layer of fiction, which is a really cool thing. This is definitely a playbook I wouldn't advise for a first-time player. I think having some of some knowledge of how the game works and everything like that first is a really good idea, and I think that goes for all three of these. Uh, the Harbinger has a move where they uh, create memories that connect to characters that exist in the world. So when you care about a character, when the character is interesting to you narratively, you basically get to make a role that says, hey, what were they in the dark dystopian future? What do I know about the future that applies to them? And so these makes these big, huge, sweeping, continuity setting things like it has for example like oh this person was a traitor and so now like let's say you use that on one of your let's say you you make a role and you it connects to one of your teammates now you know that they are a traitor that changed the universe and made it a horrible horrible place and that's so freaking cool it's moment of truth is one of my favorite moment of truths of anything I've seen, where you just connect and work together everything you know about the future, and you do what you need to do to fix this moment and make things right. But now your future's different. And that's so cool. <coughs> this also has a thing that is similar to another playbook in this list, as well as connecting to a lot of the playsets that it's changes to retire from the life. Instead of retiring or becoming a paragon, you return to the future and accept its new form or jump to a different point in the past to begin your mission anew. So this is a playbook kind of in that same vein of um, the costume changes. You don't get to retire or become a paragon from this playbook. You either go to the future and live where you've created, whatever that is, or you leave. So if you start as the Harbinger, that means, like, yeah, you can change your playbook, but that means you've given up your, you've changed your quest in some way. Yeah, it's a little sad, and so of course I love it. It's so very cool. I'm such a huge fan of it. It also is, I think, the first playbook that has different team moves from Celebrate and Share a Weakness. It's very, very neat. Um, <laughs> also, Brandon, that's... Jeff says, also, Brandon, that's almost literally the Black Gate move you pitched for the Visitor. It, it kind of is. Uh, I like things where your question is, how do you leave this place? And I think that retirement of characters is a really important thing that I think games haven't really handled. And this gives the Harbinger something different. Um, James asks, does that mean the Harbinger can play through a playbook three times instead of two? No, it still has just the one change playbooks option. Um, but it has it so that, uh, so that instead of being able to retire or become a paragon, uh, you instead get a sad ending. <laughs> uh, because the future refused to change or whatever. Um, maybe. Uh, but it's, it's very neat. Uh, it has, like, the, the fact that its team moves are different is something that we haven't seen in other playbooks. I think it's a cool new tech. It's something I want to look at. Um, it's something I'm going to be looking at for the captain and probably other playbooks that I work on because I need to start doing some masked playbooks eventually. But wouldn't, James asked, but wouldn't jump to a different point in the past and begin anew mean jump to a different point in the story and clean slate your Harbinger playbook? I don't think, I mean, th I guess that depends whether we follow the Harbinger or whether we follow the rest of the team. 
<coughs> for Protean City, I could see someone playing a Harbinger, jumping back in time, and us visiting them again as the Harbinger at a different point in time. Um, like, doing like a, uh, doing like a, who's passed from what perspective. Okay, like, you know, further back, just going, just going back and doing a thing. I think, I feel like if a player tried to say, okay, I jump to three weeks from now, I would go, okay, no, that's some nonsense. That's not, that's not the right thing. Um, no, Jeff, mission accomplished, accomplished, mission, mission accomplished is accomplished is the best update title that you could possibly do. Um, as with other playbooks, uh, the Harbinger has playing the Harbinger. It has notes on moves and extras. It has some connected characters. Uh, the characters it lists are Bishop, Deathlock, Iron Lad, Booster Gold, Impulse, and Rachel Summers. Uh, like, what else do you need to know? Those are great. It has GM advice. It has GM moves. It's wonderful. <coughs> the Nomad is America Chavez! Um, as well as a whole bunch of other people. But America Chavez! Uh, oh yeah, Jeff. It's Booster Gold. Definitely, no question. Um, uh, but moving on to America Chavez, the Nomad. The Nomad, you... Uh, are jumping around the universe. You're existing in multiple places. You're connecting your character to the universe and dimension travel and saying, hey, this is normal for me. Um, and this is another way that this is a really weird character class is it makes it so that big dimensional travel is something that exists in a way that for your character is or has been easy. Uh, you've been jumping around. You've seen worlds that people couldn't possibly comprehend. Uh, like, it, it has the ability, you've seen space-time and everything in between. One might say you've seen it all. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, but it has a change to influence in the same... Uh, anime night, how interesting. Fracture. Yes, uh, I think that Fracture would probably be the Nomad. Um, it's an interesting thing to think about because of the way that they work specifically within our fiction. Uh, I had considered the Harbinger at first, but I think that that this is maybe that Nomad is maybe the way that it would work instead. Um, uh, but this, like the Harbinger has its own little minigame, your own little story building tool set that you're playing with and working around. And your minigame is uh, putting down roots. <coughs> you do not give influence in the same ways that other people give influence. You have six influence. You have a total of six influence. You cannot give more than six influence. And you have no, adults do not, by default, get influence over you. When you start the game, you do not give influence. Uh, but it has it so that as you give more influence, you get more uh, positive abilities. Things that help you out. Uh, it's so cool. James, you're absolutely right. It is a story production machine. It pushes you to build things in wild ways. Um, and like, it has some really cool, really sad stuff. Like, if you have given out zero influence, you cannot comfort or support anyone. Uh, if you would trigger that move, instead mark a condition as you say exactly the wrong thing. Uh, the Nomad is so cool. You cannot be comforted or supported because if you don't have influence, if you don't have roots, if you don't have connections in this world, you can't connect with people in a real way. You are too weird. You're too separated. Um, I Hate Calling the Cavalry is a really cool, good move. It has you call in people beyond this world. So, like, you know, kind of like the, the, um, the outsider's moment of truth? What if that was a move that had a chance of rolling failure? Uh, James, you should totally play the Nomad. The Nomad is super sick. Um, it's really cool. 
it has a lot of like knowledge stuff and a lot of generating uh, fiction and making claims on stuff. It's very very neat. <clears throat> um, Jeff, yeah, uh, calling in the Amazonian army and oh, just a quick thing to note: these playbooks, all of these playbooks, have moves, which means you can take them from your base character. Uh, uh, the littlest space bandit. When you directly engage a threat that underestimates you, roll plus superior instead of danger. Hey, that's an amazing move for any little tiny character to take. That's so cool. Um, it's so rad. You should all check this out. Um, it has advice on playing the Nomad, notes on your moves and extra. The people it lists are uh, Cami Benali, Marvel Boy, America Chavez, The Doctor, Star Lord and Blink, uh, who's from the Exiles, in case you don't know that one. I guess people could theoretically not know the other ones too, but I wanted to call that one out specifically. Um, but uh, basically, like you have this mini game of seeing how tied in you are to Earth. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the final playbook, which is like the playbook that I most want to play for Protean City. And I, I want it to play it so badly, and I'm very worried that it's too similar to Windshare, so I don't know if I'm going to. Uh, you are the actual literal child of a truly big and scary supervillain. Why is this big and important? Because it has freaking Doctor Doom in your choices for your lineage. Instead of having just uh, instead of having just abilities. You instead choose a full lineage, which answers questions. Uh, what kind of villain are they? And it has some options there, including, importantly, uh, Cruel Mastermind. What is your relationship with them like? And it has different ways you could be connected, including uh, redemption slash corruption. Uh, you have a, they have an array of abilities, assets, and strengths. What are some of them? Oh, three of them are Dark Sorcery, Diabolical Machines, and endless minions. Uh, and what abilities do you use to fight them? Eh, all sorts of options. Uh, I, I, oh wait, hold on. I think I actually, magical aptitude and regeneration I think will hit, will hit Dr. Doom's, Dr. Uh, that child may have been else, an Elseworld child. That might not count. Um, uh, yes, Ignacio is the scion. That'd be a lot of fun. That'd be weird. Um, but he's not really a true villain. I think this is really going for, like, true, like, real villains. Like, super villains. Like, you're not playing uh, Toad's child. You're playing Magneto's child. Um, you're not playing Sandman's kid. You're playing, like... Man, who is the Spider-Man big one? This, whatever. That's not important. Uh, it's really cool. And like, oh, Magneto's in there also. Do the Hands of Evil have a kid? <laughs> I don't know if they're scary enough to count for this, but that would be delightful just to have other people play in the Hands of Evil. Ah, uh, see, this is why I'm super excited about this one. Um, yeah, probably Green Goblin or Harry Osborn. I think you're right, Jeff, that that would be the way to go. I wanted to say Green Goblin, but I, I, any time I talk about Green Goblin as like a big, scary, big villain people think of, like, the Spider-Man movies and are like, oh, Green Goblin's not scary. And it's like, no, he is, I promise. It's important. Um, but, like the other two playbooks, it has its own cool mini-game, uh, and that is respect. <coughs> this also plays with influence a little bit. Uh, so you have a list of six things, uh, people that you need to impress, whose respect you need to earn in order to dif differentiate yourself from your parents. Um, so this is like, you need to prove yourself to these people so that you can feel like a hero and people will view you as a hero because right now, everybody looks at you and goes, oh, I know you, you're Magneto's kid. All right, bye Alice, have a good dinner. I'm, this is gonna be, this stream's gonna be over pretty soon because um, I, I also need to figure out dinner. Um, but the way that it works is instead of 
giving influence, you mark res uh, respect on like a, on essentially on a clock, um, on a track, right? And so you can have up to a certain amount of respect from individuals and you get bonuses to things by having people, by having respect over them. Um, it's essentially the same as influence, but it makes it so it's a graded scale and it has it so that, uh, like, so that you get a bigger bonus to things. Um, and it makes it so that you're essentially saying to the GM, hey, just like the Harbinger, that you're saying these are the NPCs I really care about, same exact thing with respect. It's saying these are really, really cool NPCs that I really want to prove myself to. Um, and, <coughs> like, of course that means the GM should be putting you into this balancing act of working out uh, how you can gain respect from people and how you can gain influence from people, which is something the Scion is super freaking good at. Uh, it has a move that lets you ask, how could I gain influence from you, uh, even on a miss. It has a move for taking away influence from people, uh, which uh, is called They Don't Deserve Forgiveness, which is maybe the best move name. Uh, like, this this playbook was freaking made for me. Uh, it has a playbook for, it has a move for uh, that when you defend someone who doesn't believe in you, you can always take influence over them, even on a miss. Like, how cool is that? This is so much about trying to be a hero so badly. Um, but like, it's also about having this kind of dark side to you. Like, you get, s it's such cool stuff. Uh, it's amazing. It's moment of truth is so good. Uh, because it's moment of truth shows that shows how scary you are. And that's awesome. Uh, also, uh, it has the advancement that allows you to take the mask and a secret identity from the Janus playbook, which is great, because that's one of my favorite, uh, that's one of my favorite extras in the entire game. Uh, <coughs> yeah, James, if you were a GM whose party was the Scion, the Legacy, the Protégé, and the Soldier, you would never need to make NPCs ever. Uh, you could throw a Harbinger in there also, uh, and have just, like, a never-ending list of NPCs. Um, it has advice for it, it has notes on, on the moves. I'll come back to this a little bit more at some point when we do like a real deep dive into it. Uh, but inspirations for the Scion, Spoiler, Ravager, Victor Mancha, and actually for the Runaways, arguably all of them for the TV show, um, but not necessarily the same way in the comics. Um, uh, Gamora, Quake, and uh, Polaris, Quicksilver, and Scarlet Witch. Which, needless to say, those are the ones I think of. Um, because it's X-Men. But it's really, really cool. It has, like, the G I just have to go through the GM moves, even though I said I didn't want to give too much direct content out. But the GM moves are blame them for their parents' deeds, make demand, uh, grant them respect, make demands on them, interrogate their reasons or deeds, and introduce characters tied to their parent. That's so cool. Like, those all hurt so much. Because grant them respect, like, they failed at something and you grant them respect, and that makes them feel bad, and that's so good. Um, the demand, like, you're making demands on characters in ways that are huge. This is, this is the perfect playbook to play when your GM loves shifting your labels. Because it's all about dragging you in every direction. It's kind of like the legacy if your legacy members have zero built-in respect for you and you need to earn freaking everything from them. It's so good. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the legacy has, uh, your, has your legacy's greatest enemy as one of your choices. And the Scion has your parents' greatest enemy as a, cho as a choice. Like, we might need to make this happen. I might end up needing, I might end up playing the Scion. There's a possibility I'll play the Scion because it is Brandon the playbook. Uh, so we'll see if I can manage to drag myself kicking and screaming away from the hero-villain uh, dichotomy. But that is Unbound. Um, 
Let me see if Unbound is out yet. I feel like it isn't. Um, yeah, it's, it's not out yet. But it should be coming out soon. Um, there, the version that backers got looks like a kind of mere final version. It's got all the art, it's got everything in it, all the assets, all the things work out. I think, I think it's like publication ready. I'm sure there were, are little things that people have picked up that I didn't catch. <coughs> Just because that's the nature of things. But uh, as far as I can tell, this book, this book is ready for your table. And the moment you can get a chance to get it, I really recommend you get it. I think this is my favorite of the three expansions. Um, I really recommend you get all the expansions because they're super good. But this is the one that for me was the most inspirational in terms of things I want to do. Um, I have gone on a really long time. Thank you all very much for hanging out in here with me. Um, if anybody has any like last minute questions about Unbound, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, I'm going to grab this pup, bring him up onto my lap, and uh, and start doing some goodbyes. Come here. Ugh. All right, here he is. Um, I also just... Here's that pup! Here's that baby pup! Oh, why are you being weird? Come here. Get on up there. There we go. Uh, he, he, he always looks so, like... <laughs> unimpressed when I drag him up here. I also just want to say a a uh, big thank you to Prime Factor XO, XO1, who is a new follower. I think that brings us to 27 followers. When I hit 50, I'm going to have a week or two of like hardcore streaming because when I hit 50 followers, uh, that means I can go for that affiliate status. And I just want to have like the little, th just th to be recognized in that way because I think that's rad. Uh, so if you are not following, please give me a follow. If you want to get other people to follow, cool. Um, Pippin, show your face. You're so pretty. Let them see you. There you are. Um, if you, as far as I can tell, everyone in here follows me. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Dr. Captain Cobalt. You should check out Protean City Comics, especially for this stream. It is a uh, masks game. And we have a ton of fun with it. Uh, you will see playbooks from this in the future on that game. Uh, additionally, keep on checking in. Every week I will be doing this on Wednesday. It is my intention. Uh, oh, 4 out of 10. How dare you. This dog is perfect. Um, uh, oh, Jeff, thank you very much for following. Uh, that brings us to 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost at 50. Um, uh... We, I'm going to continue doing this every Wednesday. It seems to be that that's the way that kind of lines up. My hope is to do some games as well at some point. There's a couple that are kind of like vaguely on my calendar that I want to look into. Uh, my intention is to get some guests. If you have ideas for a stream, something you'd like to see, hit me up. Um, I'm also going to be trying to just keep doing some mass content. I'm all about mass content. Um, Jeff, it's okay to break down if you need to. Uh, you're going to do an awesome backer update. Uh, huge, huge shout outs to Jeff Stormer of Party of One and All My Fantasy Children and Mission Accomplished, which funded during this stream. That's amazing. I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud that that, that happened. Uh, maybe we can get Mission Accomplished on this stream sometime soon. I would absolutely love that. Um, and, uh... I think that's about it. Uh, if you want to hear more game design talk, check out Stop, Hack, and Roll. Uh, it is a podcast all about game design talk. Uh, but follow this channel if you want more stuff. Uh, Angel, I'd love to to come in and chat with... I'd love to have you come on and chat about stuff in here as well at some point. This is kind of a way for me to do casual fun chats where I don't need to like prep stuff in a huge way. And it lets me just kind of have my excited raving. Um, yeah, the Protean City feed also uh, is a great place to see mask stuff. When we play Falcon Agents, getting back from a... Oh, crap. That's really good. We should play Mission Accomplished in Protean City. That would be a lot of fun. Maybe... Mm, let's talk. <coughs> That's kind of like the underlying like thing for this is let's talk. Um, yeah, for Mission Accomplished, exactly. Uh, but... That is all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in to a special giant-sized weekly check-in. 
uh, about Masks Unbound. Go check out Masks Unbound if you have not backed Mission Accomplished. Go back Mission Accomplished. It is an amazing game. And uh, I will catch all of you next week. Have a good one, everybody.